So while they were praying, they were like praying a warfare prayer that day. And the next thing I noticed beside me in my sitting room that the ground beside my sitting room puffed open. You will hear the word of God as if God was actually speaking to you one on one. You are hearing things you don't hear in the regular church. Sunday, Sunday does not solve Christianity by The way the world is being taught in this place, I'm here to see somewhere else. Generations to generations, I'll keep telling them that the God of Royal Holy Village too has done me. Precisely November, I can't remember that, I think it should be 20th of November, 1996. I prayed, I took her time to pray, and the Holy Spirit laid in my heart, I should go and join the children department. And as I entered the class, lo and behold, this person I saw, she was wearing this white caftan, and my heart, you know, when the Bible describe Mary and Elizabeth encounter that the child in the womb lived. That was my experience with her that very Sunday. I knew Mommy Duru before I knew the ministry. And I remember I used to see her from far. I don't know what made me take notice of her. But I always bumped into her. She was in children's department and I was also in children's department. My heart just leaped that there's something about this woman. I just heard in my spirit follow her. She had this courage about her, and something inside of me will always say to me, if only you can be serious, you'll be like that woman. Because she has this love for teenagers, teenagers will come to her for counseling in church. At every point in time, they are always coming to for counseling. And it got to a point where, you know, the church could not accommodate all those things, they would, she would give them address to her house. They would come to her house, have uh, fellowship with her. And along the line, women also started coming in. I was at a point in my life where I was going through a lot of stuff. I heard the Lord say to me, go and join that fellowship that your friend runs. This was how I heard it. So I said, fellowship, who is my friend? I now discovered that the friend God was referring to was late um, Momiduru. So I didn't know the name of the fellowship and I didn't know when they met. So but I knew that there was this um, lady, um, Dickiness Ezekiel, that was close to her. So I was looking for her. So that Wednesday, coincidentally, Ezekiel passed through my shop on her way from fellowship. So I said to her, I've been looking for you. There's this fellowship when we do runs I'm supposed to attend. She said, ah, that's where I'm coming from. We meet on Wednesdays. That was, I think, the second official meeting royal um, women. It was purely the royal women fellowship. That was the second meeting they had. And it was in somebody's parlor. So I was told then that what had been happening is that they would meet to pray in her parlor. Started with two women, then they became four. So when they got to four, they now decided to use this apartment. So it's this apartment they've now moved to that I now... So let's say that was about the first official meeting outside the parlor. And then they had invited quite some women, but even that quite some women, it was a parlor full. Three women in a sitting room. They would pray and go. And before you know it, they moved to a, one of the members, they moved to our house, we were having fellowship there. And one thing led to the other, we had to look for a new venue. Before the meeting we hold, when it was to hold, we got a message that uh, we can't use the place where we used before, that the lady had complaints about her tissue paper, that people came and rolled her tissue paper, <laughs> one funny story. So mommy began to fret. 
and she was like hey hey where will she gather the women now we were about seven that meeting were about 15 20. so now 15 20 people have come and now there's no way and one of the women that came ah that along that street there's an event center so on tuesday we march to the um, uh, to a sports center along that street and we got there we looked for the manager we explained to him that can we come and be using this place it's a wednesday and the man agreed so that wednesday when mommy was already fretting where we gathered to i remember we went to the sports center and if i'm not mistaken we were seven so we didn't have to arrange we sat down in a semicircle no we we're four that succeeded after that semicircle seven that's how fellowship started my first encounter with Royal Olive Ministry was over 16 years ago. Uh, then the ministry office was at number uh, two Oyotubo by Balogu bus stop Ikeja. And I was living at number three, the house beside the office. Well, every Tuesday they hold their prayer school meeting. I was sitting by my sitting room side and I heard this prayer going on in the next building and the prayer moved my spirit. I heard women pray the way I never imagined in my life. The upper one Tuesday I decided I'm not going out. Let me join this people again. So while they were praying they were like praying a warfare prayer that day. And the next thing I noticed beside me in my sitting room that the ground beside my sitting room puffed open and the charm that was buried there for a long time came up. I was not in the prayer meeting, I was in the house beside the prayer meeting while the prayer was going on. Fat for a while, we stayed there for a long time and then this fellowship started increasing in numbers, women coming from different places. And the beautiful thing about this is you will come and by the time you hear the word, that's one of the things that thrill me about the fellowship. And Mommy Dur was a very dynamic teacher. Um, I wasn't a baby Christian. I had come through a lot of schooling, so I knew some. So to really sit, and one thing I observed, sorry, Women, by my assessment then, didn't handle the scriptures. They handled it like women. I saw the raw power of God transformation on in every fellowship meeting we had. Because it was not about prophecy. Because when I joined, it was not a prophetic ministry. But I saw God's word that was changing lives. You see, you will hear the word of God as if God was actually speaking to you one on one. So direction was coming directly from the word of God. There is no way you will come in contact with her that you will not be blessed. The word that will come, you wondering, we have I been all this while. So uh, hearing mommy do handle the scriptures, I was like, wow. My very first encounter with a royal women fellowship, let me put it that way, was through a friend who has gone to be with the Lord now. And um, that was in um, 2000 and nine so she invited me that there's a place that she's found and the, the teaching of the word is solid um the prayer is something else i said okay then i went with her for the first time they were meeting at the to tobo center beside saint leo women started coming in those who are yet to know christ basically most of the people that were coming are people that were in the church having issues with their children, having issues with their husbands, in-laws and all manner. And because it's an inter interdenominational, it made, she made it open like, it is not only people that are coming from our church or from Pentecostal churches. Even Catholics were coming, people from different places were coming. One thing though, we always had favor because our meetings were on Wednesdays, so all the places we had to use, they gave us huge concessions because it was an off day. 
We always came with this logic that after all, you would have locked the place. Nobody is on Wednesday. A Tobol event sent, ah, Tobol. Tobol Nights, they built something there. It was Tobol. That was where we really, let me use the word, hammered. Because all those people in St. Leo, women who had issues in their homes, every, ah, it was huge. Tobol was, we were crossing then as many as 300 women sometimes. And we would have programs at times, where Tobol was pretty big. Then the persecution started. Problems. Husbands, churches, pastors. They began to look for us physically and spiritually. What was our offense? We were opening the eyes of the women. The women were now knowing scriptures. They were praying. Things were happening in their homes. Um, Mommy Duru was primarily... I wouldn't even want to call her um, a prophet. She was an apostle. Because she was doing pioneering work that people had not done. She was setting up structures. But because there was no model that we had to follow, she was just... But now looking back, all those things that she was doing was pioneering, coming up with structures. And it's the same structures that we are still following today. Mommy Duru was a prolific teacher. She was also a core intercessor. That's why I said she was more apostolic than prophetic. But she would give you mainly homework and assignment for those of us who were following her. She would come and give you structure, you go and read the book. It's you that will expand the message to the dimension she has reached. So she will set you up and she will compare you to come to where she is. Not only that, she's praying and she's telling you your life story. She's doing warfare entering into homes, dealing with strong men in families. It wasn't too common then. Most of the people that we had, it is in, it, we were interdenominational. But many of them were coming from, as at that time, if there was anything about deliverance, the only ministries then that we knew talked about deliverance was Deeper Life and uh, maybe Mountain on Fire. So even our own church didn't talk deliverance. They believe that as you are teaching the word, deliverance is taking place. They have a problem with demons and they are giving two or three books to read. But you are coming to a place where you have a problem. Somebody is standing in the prophetic office and actually binding, loosening, casting out. It wasn't common in our circle. So to that point, it was a rallying point. And the women... You know, one of the um, tenets of the ministry is to build a bridge in families, Isaiah 58. We had a lot of families that were really breached, broken. Husband, not believing. A lot of the husbands then belonged to one thing or the other. That their wives and children were suffering from. Children, not... So, mommy brought parenting into the forefront. Parenting is a higher level of leadership. What that means is you can give a coach access to your mind and your brilliance, and you can give a mentor access to speak over your life, right? You can give your spiritual leader access to speak over your spirit and to nourish, you know, what is your faith. But the power in parenting is that you can do all of those things in one go. Now, parenting is such a systematic framework, right, by God, that it helps you unlock different potentials in a human being at different points in time, at different stages, without a defined time, timeline. But what happens for a lot of us, we're not strategic <laughs> as regards our curriculum or as, a, as regards our model. Whereas with Lois, she hacked this. Maybe not, she wouldn't have described it with the language with which I'm describing it today, but this was what she did. So my mother understood this is my strength. This is who Chimamaka is. And she would always say, um, you know, that she prayed to God and asked God about who I was and who my brother was and different people who each person, you know, was and stuff like that. And so she had a different curriculum for each person. It was very, very peculiar, very tailored. For example, someone else can sit in this chair and talk about my mother and talk about her in a different like use similar words but the impact is different like 
they, she shifted them from X to Y. For each person, they can connect their faith and different aspects of their lives to something they learned from her, to what she modeled, to what she lived. And I think that's really the, what's the word now? That would really be the experience for a lot of people in Royal Women Fellowship. She started the Children's Bible Club, but her own version of it was centered around her. She was the person that would gather them. So it wasn't this big thing. It was the children within her neighborhood and the children of women of the fellowship. She would gather in one parlor, teach them to have a fun day. I didn't used to do, go that, do that with her, but every other thing, I would be there because they will pick an odd day, it may not be announced. So children's Bible study started. At some point, one of her birthdays, she started what we now have as Royal um, Priest Bible Club. She called statute keepers. So she had this group of men that would gather in a house. They would study the Bible. Now the garden was in a house. So a lot of what they did or didn't do, I was not privy to it. It was the men, maybe about eight to ten or thereabout. But one thing is, the key then was studying the Word of God. Now, Mommy Dool was a refined woman that knew all the things they had to. She had etiquette, she had manners. She was trained like royalty, teaching women how to parent their children, discovering purpose. She was literally a pioneer. So. You are hearing things you don't hear in the regular church. And not only that, it is backed up with manifestation of power. So she's preaching, she's praying, signs are happening all around this one woman. And she was in dummy table. She's ready to follow. What did you say your husband did? Let's go to your house. Yes. When we do look at your husband and say, but you know you're a thief now. You just stole your wife's money. She was that that when she's sitting so every she was like a leader of a women's army it was a new phenomenon so those who really were hungry for god found a place to express themselves that was not church so you didn't have to invite them they were hungry they were ready they were coming and they were not disappointed and this is how i like to think of it the same god who is lion is also lamb. He's both a consuming fire and he speaks in a gentle, still voice. He's both the king of kings, Yahweh Sabaoth, and he's your compassionate, tender lover. And that's exactly the same picture with Lois, right? I find that my mother is not strong in herself, right? The Bible talks in Proverbs 31 that strength and dignity are her clothing. And I think that's Proverbs 31, 25, the A part of it, if I'm right. And I think I am. And that's exactly Lois. There is a lot of strength, but that strength is not of her own self. So that strength is gleaned and drawn from the depth of her intimacy with Christ. But the real Lois, the real flesh, is a baby girl. <laughs> She's such a baby girl. Like it's my mother who would say, she would shake you and say, ah, why are your palms hard? You should moisturize, you know. And <laughs> and that same hand, she, 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 I, I was that same hand when he hits you, my God, when he hits you, it'll be like it cannot be. As soon as I got there after the second meeting or thereabout, I'm like, why do you want me to come here? And God spoke to me and said. He was sending me to go and wait on her the way Elisha waited on Elijah. Then he also talked about Moses and Aaron. And I'm like, okay, so I'm not just going there. I'm just going there to go and serve. How many were we then? So I had that understanding and I went there with all this. So she knew who I was and I was available. So I was the driver of the ministry. I was her PA was everything. I'll go pick her up from her house, take her to fellowship, drop her back home, and I'll go back. And after a while, I remember, not too long, we're now beginning to stabilize a bit, meaning we're now passing the seven mark, we're now moving towards 20, we're beginning to spread. And one day I took her um, home and she looked at me. 
He said, could you give me some space? You're choking me, you know. She said that to me directly. So I said, ah. In my mind, I was already getting tired. Having to go and pick her up, drop her. And she wasn't friendly like that to me. So, so when I heard that, I'm like, ah, thank you, Jesus. So as I turned to go, I remember I met her after that in church. It was a corridor. So because she had told me that, I said, God, she be here. She said, I'm choking her, so I'm free. And he said to me, did she call you? I sent you. So I said, God, if it is indeed you that sent me, speak to her. I'm available. She doesn't want. And then not long after that, I remember she used you people then to summon me. Not you. You were not there then. Your two sisters to summon me. And I now worked with this reluctance like you already said I should give you space. And by the time I got close to her, she was like, go and read. She gave me the scripture about Elijah and Elisha. I said, I know what it says. She said, talked about Moses. I said, I know what it says. And she looked at me. I said, that is what, and I was very raw. That was one thing. Now, Mommy Duru was a refined woman that knew all the things they had to, she had etiquette, she had manners. She was trained like royalty. I was very intelligent, but a very raw worry girl. So I said things the way I, I saw it. But Mommy Duru, Mommy Duru had this way of being very, very cultured. So I was the exact opposite of her. So I just said it to her. I said, hey, Chibi, that's what I've been trying to tell you now that God said I should come and do Elisha for you. You say I shouldn't come. And the way I said it, she just looked at me, shook her head like, we never had that discussion again. But from then on, it was just like it was assumed. So I was around her, observing, asking questions. I was just everything around her then when the ministry was coming up. I was, it was my car that was the ministry car. Then the school was being set up. So gradually it began to grow. I remember um, when we did our first anniversary, there were quite some, quite some then about 70 or so. Whoa, we're almost now feeling that hall. And by the time, I think it was when we were doing year three, um, we invited, he's late now, Prophet uh, Biemi. He came and had these big prophecies. I remember because people really prophesy into my life, but that man that day spoke to me and said, ah, he said, he sees me that will grow and will be ministering to nations and different currencies of the world will be coming in and all of that. Where I was, I'm like, <laughs> When I joined, I used to be a running member. That means run away member. After the service, I would just find a way to escape because I don't want to be inside because I saw it as women ministry and then because of what we've been hearing about women gathering together. So I decided to just stay aside. Come pick the word that concerns me. It was the word that was really drawing me closer to the ministry. So after the service, I would just escape going and going like that. Until I think it was um, 2013, entering to 2014, when the thing was getting clearer and clearer, that I had an assignment that God is calling me to do, and which is intercession. And we started with uh, mommy nursing. And uh, mommy nursing used to be somebody that when you are close to her, you must fulfill purpose. So based on that, I became like involved somehow in the prayer aspect of the ministry. That means secretly, we used to have a place where we meet together with Mommy Nessie to pray, to intercede for the ministry. Unknown to the visionary then, Mommy Duru. So gradually, I was very, very close to Mommy Nessie, but running away from Mommy Duru. Reason which I don't know. And I know they used to call me Mommy Nessie's sister. She used to call me Mommy Nessie's sister. Maybe she believed that we are that close. So that was how gradually I started coming close to the ministry. Until 2016. Before 2016, I think it was 2015 thereabout. I'm not too sure of the date. And there was one of her sister that uh, put to bed, Sister Kimbuku, and they were to go and visit her. So I thought within myself that 
is not good because she was somehow close to me. I used to drop her by the road after fellowship. So she put to bed after some a long wait, waiting for a long time. So we were able to go to her place. So I decided that I was going with them. I went to her house. Unknown to me that Mommy Duru will be there. On getting there, as we were just packing, I saw Mommy Duru come in to Sister Petra that brought her. I was like, just to looking for a way to run. So while I, where I was sitting, she came to meet me there and she sat beside me. And she spoke her dialect, Igbo language, as if, and cash you today. And I don't know, she now told me that, what did I do to you? Why are you running away? Obviously, to be true, to be sincere, I cannot even place why I'm running away from this woman. And she now said, book an appointment, I'm coming to your house. That was where the old Wahala started. I call it Wahala because I knew there was a call of God upon my life, which I was trying to put aside and to face the business aspect of my life. And you know, of course, the business aspect was really paying me, giving money. So I decided to follow that aspect. So eventually she came to my place and the day she came, being a prophet, she stepped her feet in my home and she told me some things. And that was how the whole thing started. I was asked to join the prayer squad, but I was still running away until 20, I think 2015, then about or so, I joined. I, it was later, I later found out that it was as a result of this prophetic call of God upon my life and everything around me was making sure that I am not close to her. But several times she sees me, she invites me to her house, some she will beat me. You don't know who you are. If you know who you are, you occupy your place. And I was looking at her, ah, at the top money, this woman, they tell me the thing, well, no, no. But eventually, gradually, you know, I will find myself coming closer. I don't know what was bringing me closer. I remember one day she brought me to her house. She just told me, look, this is where I used to, this is where I used to pray. Go there, time yourself one hour. After that, you can go. I was there, and after one hour, I left. The first thing that happened that um, shook us, you see, we were raising this army and we believed we were invincible, we were untouchable. Mommy had raised us to believe when you are standing, nothing can happen to anybody in your home. Your husband is safe and all of that. And from out of the blues, right in front of us, her husband gets killed. So uh, it was a major blow, shaking. Now, but the truth of the matter is that we were, we, the followers then, and I was among the leading ones, we were very um, immature. We were not in the dark, but we didn't figure it was us. I remember um, one of the meetings just before um, that dude was killed. We were having a meeting in, then we were already using light, chapel of light, yes, yeah, chapel of light. And she was um, um, praying and then she goes into the prophetic and then she, she goes and she says, hmm, who knows what Mrs. Duru here? Which of our members is Mommy Duru? Because she was giving the prophecy in a third party. He said, ah, conspiracy to kill the husband. He said, tell her there is a conspiracy to kill her husband. Hey, people should pray for her. I took the prophecy. And we closed and I spent, ah, ah, which of what we do this relative comes to the fellowship that we don't know so that we can tell the woman who to stand up. Now, this was not long after <laughs> and then that the Duru dies. And then, Everything that was going down, I remember when Daddy Duru died, it was pandemonium. A lot of those that had come, and then we were quite, I mean, on a regular fellowship they were doing over 200 plus, not programs. So you are leading 200 women that believe that you are invincible. The ministry is invincible. And right in front of us, that scripture, strike the shepherd and the sheep. So the minute that happened, first there was confusion. And I remember the leading women came and said, Ah, fellowship must stop. Ah, it's not chicken that died, though. Fellowship must stop. And I was the only one who said, No, why? I said, Fellowship could not stop. 
I said, the fellowship is not about that. I said, a lot of these people now have questions they'll be asking. If we shut down fellowship, dogs and warmongers will answer their questions. I said, it will be too late for us to gather them back. I said, so we need a platform where when they are confused, they will come and they can still get their questions answered scripturally. That whether or not this has happened, God is still in control. So I had to, it was like a one, Mamidu was not in any condition to say anything. She was just in a state of shock. But I remember, and that's why I tied up, one of the days, because I had to stay far to hold the women together. I remember one of the days I went to the house and the usual cluster people were around her. And she looked at me, she said, did God not tell us? So I looked at the other women and I'm like, when did God tell us? She said, uh uh. Did God not tell us that Mrs. Duru's husband was going to be killed? It was there in that place. I said, Who? 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 Me? That prophecy was for. Is there now God told that she's also Mrs. Duru? Why did it not cross her mind? So God spoke. We didn't hear. Ah, it was a long battle. She had to be indoors to mourn her husband. She was very close to her husband. Um, in fact, nothing happens without Daddy Duru. They were that tight. So for him to just go like that, it was an uphill task. Um, I had to now automatically, leadership was just trust upon me. And I had to... But the type of leadership that came upon me then was this idea of having to harness the women, hold them together. Now, I am not a very emotional person. So I think the advantage I had, I was one of the few people who was not crying. I was sorrowing, but I wasn't sorrowing crying. So my eyes were shining. So while others were crying and generally trying to comfort her, I was with a clear head and trying to make things work. Fellowship must hold. I'll go back to her. Um, what is it that we're supposed to teach? I remember I didn't ask her the first ones. I knew the messages then had to be how to get the women to understand that living or dead, God must be glorified. Now we did all of that. So the next battle, after Daddy Dur was buried, and mommy had to come out. Now, uh, ministry is wonderful. As I, I, I got to learn a lot about people, especially women. Now, even in that moment of her pain, I know there was a lady that came, she was sitting down, and she said, hey, mommy, I came to you for cancer, you know, and she looks at her, like, daddy was still in the mug. He said, you know that you are mommy, Duru, now, daddy has died, my own is still alive, I need help. And she goes on, so, she talks, mommy answers, and then when she leaves, mommy turns to us, that do these people know that I'm a human being? And I said to her, they don't know the human being about you. What they know is their leader. For me, being around Mommy Duru, everything was a school. Her highs, her lows. I kept watching, I kept asking questions. Now, honestly, I never saw myself as a direct line leader. I will tell you and I will tell anybody who cares to listen. My favorite book is Second in Command. I love being Aaron. Let Moses go to the mountain. See all the vision come. I will help him execute it. That burden of having to go to the mountain and receive instruction was not my friend. So mommy ran and talk and that's what she did. She would go, she would receive the instruction. She would just come, dump it on my lap. We are having anniversary. Mommy Duru would take the theme. That's the end. How we did, in fact, the newsletter, she will see it the morning of the anniversary. And you will know whether you succeeded or failed by the eye she will give to you. If she looks at it and you don't get that eye, you have passed. The word came for her when I released that word to her that God said he has shifted the ministry to nursing. She heard me and she said something. She said, baby, just keep praying for me. And 
on the line on this ministry, anything God reveals to you, don't keep it to yourself. Try and speak it out. She turned again, why going? She said, even if I'm in the ministry or I'm no more in the ministry, I want you to remain there. At this time now, a lot was being put in my hands, but I didn't say it that way because I love the idea of making things happen but not taking responsibility of leadership. And in the week, she can wake up one day and tell you she's not doing anything. She's not going to minister on a Wednesday. She's not doing anything. She just wants to stay in her father's presence. But towards the end, she will go for like a month and she will come to fellowship maybe just once. And then it started becoming better in Jesus' name. We should actually be in the Kedja and we are expecting her for fellowship at about 9 or 9.30. I'll get a message. You are going to teach. On Friday, she, she called me. Yes, in the morning. She asked, Sister, where are you? I said I was at home. She said, make sure you see me today. If you don't see me, I don't think you will see me again. I didn't understand what was actually going on. I, I got to the office. When I got to the office, I saw... I saw some people in there, they said she had gone. And she told them that when Esther comes, tell her she must look for me anywhere. First of all, I believe strongly without a doubt that my mother knew she wouldn't, she knew she was going to go. Exactly. So she knew in very clear terms. In fact, I believe she knew she wouldn't go past a certain point. But because of certain things she had said both to me and my brother. Right? <laughs> so... She knew what she was doing when she started to, and God was also, God was also um, preparing her, equipping her, kind of giving her hints, you know, you need to soft pedal here, you need to X, Y, Z here. Um, so yeah, I believe that she knew. E.G., I remember when my mom said at some point that, um, I think this was like July, that it would be her last, and she had said, she had stopped teaching for a while actively. And then I think the July before she passed in August, I remember her saying, I don't know if she told other people, but she had said to me clearly that this would be the last fellowship she would teach in. I remember she told me she had a vision. She explained it. She said she saw herself on the mountaintop. That's the first time. And she didn't just tell me when I joined her. She said she saw herself on the mountain and two women came. And she had this Olympic torch in her hand. And she saw herself putting the torch to light the, um, I don't know what they call them, those um, torch stands. He said, she lit myself and one other lady. And both of us ran down the mountain. And as we were running down, we were lighting the torches of other women we saw. That was the uh, introduction. The first time she began to give me an understanding of what was the picture that God gave her when I came. Now, this picture was silent all this while until the last year she was going to um, pass on. And she says, we're going to have an anniversary. And she says she wants candles. That that um, vision that God gave to her, that she thinks it's about time now, that she's seen herself uh, prophetically lighting candles. So I should go and get candles. So I brought the candle and during the anniversary, we now call out all the different groups. We put the candle in everybody's hand and mommy has the candle and suddenly she says, Mrs. Nelson, where are you? And then she says this. She said, take. She put the big candle and said, now begin to light other candles. Before that, I think it was a Friday. Friday, yeah? And mama sent for me. One sister, goodness, was still in the ministry then. She was the lead Levite. So that day she was going out. She just said bye to me then. As she was walking down, goodness went down with her, stayed for a while. And I remember goodness came up and said, ah, mama said to tell me her that she should come and pray with me oh, that the ball is now in our court. To cut a long story short, that was the last time I saw mama alive. So walked into her room and her head, she was sitting, she was supposed to be sitting up on her bed, but her head was hanging a bit funny. It was limp, 
you know, to the side. And immediately I opened her door, the first thing I said was, God, no, you know. But I knew, and I went close to her, I tried to wake her up. In fact, I remember telling, the way I told my brother was, mommy's not waking up. You know, that's the only way I had to express what I was trying to say. And I remember him saying, what does that mean? I honestly remember my mom coming into my room early hours of that morning and speaking to me. But, <laughs> um, yeah, but it was dark. I don't remember what time it was. I know it was early, maybe about 4-ish a.m., right? And, but then if you put everything together, it means that she was gone because by the time I found her at almost 7 o'clock, she was cold. So wore her, her pajamas, trousers, she was wearing a nightgown. I called someone who I knew attended church close by so that she could drive me there. Um, called my brother. I prayed, I anointed her. The next call I get is from Amaka, her daughter, on the Sunday. It's very unlike Amaka. And why would she call me on the Sunday? Uh, so she's like, um, ah, mommy Nancy, start coming, oh. Start coming, oh. It's mommy Duru. I said, mommy, what's wrong with mommy Duru? She said, eh, she has start coming. I don't know how I drove from Lekki to Keja, but all I was saying is that, hey, God, don't try me. Don't let anything do her. Just let me shall go and reach there. You know, I just had this mind that, Sha, when I get there, when I see everything will be all right. Proud to her death, had an encounter where there was an encounter I was told in the dream that mommy has passed on and we prayed in that dream she came back to life. Only waking up in the morning I went to church. I was in the church, my phone was on silent. My daughter came to meet me that mommy is calling me. And I went to pick her call and she told me to come to the fellowship center that there is the fellowship office then at Orego that that's mommy Duru. It's they say sick or what did they call it? Just I should come. There's an emergency. Actually, when I was going, I called Sister Mercy. <laughs> okay. So she said, ah, that whatever it is, God has shown her the vision. She's coming back to life. Nothing they happen. I said they come home because it they happen. I was just galloping like us. Entered Okada. Flew to the place. I will call it flu because it was, I don't know the speed that took me there. We got there, I saw her. But because of the encounter that we prayed, she came back to life. I just told mommy, Nessie, anoint me, pour oil on me, pour oil on me. Little did I know that there was, I was to draw virtue. Because I remember she would tell me, oh, there's something I need to give to you. There's nothing, but you are mommy, Nessie's sister. Mm. She was resisting it. I don't know that it was the thing that was just, that was working against she transferring the mantle, the mantle of the prophetic because this ministry also operates in the prophetic. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we took her to the office, laid her in our prayer room, then we started praying. I called Yadura, like she said. We started, come, when they say Jesus prayed and his sweat turned to blood, I experienced it that day. I prayed until true, true, my sweat was becoming slimy. It was in the heat of prayer. This my wonderful prophet said, anoint me, anoint me. Me to Iran, I brought a bottle of oil. Anoint, eyes, mouth, everything. On getting the answer to anoint me, she anoint me, I lie on her, mouth to mouth nose to nose, everything, just the way the prophet lied on the boy that was dead. Whether she would say tapita rice. <laughs> we are doing impartation, what to bring the body back to life. Until they put her in a body bag, body bag, and took her to the mall. It was there the thing done on me. And even with that safe, I didn't even know what has happened. I waited for the sneeze. Nothing happened. Then I remember Things was Sister Ibele. Now, for the first time, Professor, he said, People are asking me to bring her back, bring her back. Can you people pray to sustain her if I bring her back? All of us shouted, We will pray. We will pray. Just bring her back. <laughs> and she became colder. 
after about one hour, it just dawned on me that this woman is gone. We were still on that, and I remember one of the people that would have called the leaders in the ministry came and said on Tuesday that her time was up. <laughs> Mama, God told her she was going to pass through Samaria for two years. And Mama died on Saturday, Tuesday, at two years expired, so she has finished. She's leaving Samaria. So Mama has died. The few ones remaining to help me, one has crossed Samaria. And I'm like, what? But there was something that I knew had to happen. Fellowship must stay hold. Actually, I wasn't convinced yet that I should continue in the ministry after Mommy Duvu died. But Mommy Nelson sent me a message that I was going to join the prayer squad after Mommy Duvu died. So in the place of prayer, God turned out his voice and said, the visionary had died, but the vision had not died. He said, the visionary had died, but the vision had not died. So we should all stand to carry the vision with him to the, to the place he was actually taking it. That was when I was already convinced that there was a reason why God anointed me. And that, that was, since then, I've been in the ministry till now. After the servant of God died, um, family members started asking questions. The person that made you to stay, she's gone. That what are you still doing in the ministry? But I remember that, that before it happened, that God already showed it to me. And the Momiduru was away because she wanted to hear what God said at our last Tuesday meeting. She said, somebody had a word for me here and I want to hear it. Nobody stood. And she looked at my eyes and said, you have the word for me. I want to hear so I told her, can we go outside? When I went when we were outside, I told her that God has given the ministry, I've released the ministry to Mommy Nelson. And she just said one word, if you keep praying for me, I know. Go back to Mommy Nelson and say the same thing to her. And so why people are saying, what are you still doing in the ministry? I said, I already know. So that is one of the things that kept me because God already revealed it to me. Number one, if you are in a place, you are not there because of the vision. Yeah. That's what something, a message I want to pass. If you go to a place because of the vision, yeah, the day God takes the vision, yeah, you go with the vision. Yeah. But if you go to a place where you want to meet with God, God don't die. God is ever present. So if you believe that God is still present, you still follow the presence and the flow of God. So after Mamedou died, a lot of people left with the vision. Yeah. And a lot of people that saw God and knew that God was still present after the visionary stayed. So we were in prime moves, as I said. And you know, we are, financial, we are facing some financial challenge. We had this place for a very long time. For very, very many, many years ago, I can remember when this place was bought. And I think one of the plans then was to use it for, a, a, I think, a vo um, vocational class or school, something. But in the place of prayer, God told us to move. To move from Primos in Ikeja to Agege. So and most of our, um, our members were Ikeja people. So moving from Ikeja to Agege was a challenge. But what to obey God's voice? But immediately we moved. A lot, another, people, some, another set of people had to drop again. So we came to Agege and we began afresh. I think it was in 2017. I was still shortling between being active in business, looking for audio money. So I was shortling between Ibadan and Lagos. So I will come on Monday to observe the Monday prayer. On Tuesday prayer meeting, I will go back. If I sorry for them, I will come on Wednesday. And I remember my elder sister asking me, ha, who is the next person to mommy I pointed to Sister Petra because I wasn't ready for anything. I was ready to go and get money, sponsor the work of God. Until 2018, when the whole thing done on me, it came for, I started, I think from after the death of Mommy, 2016, 2017, yes, 18, then the prophetic gift. And the day I knew that something has transpired, 
in my life from Momiduru was I walked into the fellowship center and there's a sister that we used to know. Immediately saw me, she was afraid. And I was worried after the service and I went to meet her. And she now told me that immediately I was coming in, she saw Momiduru. In this a prophetic work, the way she will walk. And I said, Kai, gang, gang, gang. I've gone to collect something that must account for. But to cut the whole long story short, eventually it was in 2018. Now don't know me that really you collected this mountain of the prophetic from Momiduru. A fellowship that we're talking about 180 people in attendance. We are now talking about 39 people. And the, even that 39, a lot of them came out of curiosity. They wanted to see the bush that we had gone to, that God has forsaken us into in their minds. So they came. But that meeting, the first Wednesday, we had a fellowship here. One of the women that came, as we were rounding up, came and met me, said God has been flogging her that every outstanding bill in that center which was, I think, about 70,000, she should clear it. So she went and cleared it. So automatically, we move from deficit to balance. Balance. At least now we don't have to pay 20,000 every week. So we come in here, and then, of course, when God has commissioned, we started small, small. We began to increase. Then towards the end of one year, God said, we should knock down the walls of Jericho. It was knocking down the walls of Jericho that moved us from here to here, and then eventually to this which we are seeing. But for every step that um, God has instructed us, God helped us. Now we suffered a major fraud in the assignment, and that was occasioned by the fact that um, when Mama was alive, I never had anything to do with the finance. It was between her and the accountant. All I was interested in was the running of the ministry. So what came in or didn't come in, I never asked. So naturally, when Mama died too with the tussle, honestly, I never asked to. All I would just say is, hey, God said we should do this. Do we have enough money in the account? And the accountant would tell me something like, hey, yes, so we have enough, Abby. Then at the end of the program, hope we are not owing. We are not owing. So whatever we had to do, God supplied. We just had peace. When we wanted to do these chairs, I remember, when we announced it, uh, it was an um, enthronement um, seed. Each person bring one or two. Somebody then gave a million and we bought almost all the chairs. Then, that's how the chairs came. The other time we wanted musical instruments. When we costed it, it was about a million or so. Somebody volunteered. So it's been from one level of ease to the other by the provisions of God. So when it comes to money, Considering we started with 40,000 in the account, see where we are today, and we are debt free. Before I came to Royal Relief Ministry, I have a lot of issues in my life. I think I would rather use the word baggage. Um, I had a failed marriage, I lost identity. A lot of things went wrong with me. So I was in Lagos. I came in contact with my, my elder brother's wife, which is my sister-in-law. And she kept talking about the fellowship, that um, the, she goes to a fellowship. The power of God is always strong in the fellowship. And I called her one day. I said, come. I said, please, I want to meet the woman that is in charge of the fellowship. If she could help me out of my predicaments. So she said she was going to fix a day for the meeting. And when I came that day, it was a Monday, I was asked to sit down somewhere around here. So said it was time for Faith Theater. So when I came, 
we were in the faith theater. The presence of God was so great. I still open my eyes one by one, checking what everything everybody was saying was on point. At the time, one of them stood up and hit me. That the assignment God committed into your hands. You are not dead. My mind, I said, assignment, call, assignment. I said, I come. My life was out of touch. But gradually, the God of Royal Holy Ministry began with me. I remember that word. God kept telling me, I'm a work in progress. I'm a work in progress until he has brought me to where I am today. Yeah, it was through my wife anyway. Um, the whole thing started in two years ago when I had a um, very strong uh, financial crisis. I lost money. I invested in a failed uh, business. This is uh, a cheap mall business. You can hear about that. So I invested a lot of millions that never came back. From there, frustration started and I got into uh, borrowing money from a lot of uh, what is, uh, apps, bank apps and all that. So I got devastated. At the time, I thought suicide, but just because I know deeply about the scripture, understanding that suicide is never the best option. I want to not go moving from fire, pan to fire, okay? But I thought suicide anyway. So at the time, I started losing it all. People started avoiding me. The church, we numerically, we reduced drastically in number. And my family's in-laws, nobody was even coming very close to you know, um, attend to me and at the same time they gave us a quick notice where we are we were staying in the church at the same time quick notice in my house double quick notice you know someone who has family family of six my wife and four children so when my wife told me about the ministry regular ministry i had no option than to come why because i saw a lot of changes in her character so that propelled me that moved me to so okay this place should be a good place so let me come give a try and that was what brought me here. When I came, the, I explained my ordeal. And this is the same ordeals that after explaining in certain places, people would just avoid me from that day on. But what surprised me was that the ministry didn't avoid me. They paid attention, they stood. Uh, most especially uh, Mommy Nelson. She stood in the gap. Financially, they stood for me. Spiritually, they stood. You know, and that's just how the whole uh, story started. And here I am today, all those things are now Bible. Before I joined, as in before I started, before moving to this place, or should I say before I joined the prayer team, I, I was born again, I told you, but I couldn't hear God. So from the prayer team, when we came here, then the polishing school, the very first set of polishing school that I attended, you know, there they talked about how to hear God and things like that. Then books reading and hands being laid, I was able to hear God now. So every day in my house, it's like God is speaking, downloading, and I'm writing, and I, you know, instructions what to do. Coming here is um, more like an eye-opener. I, I realize that perhaps most of us have been praying without the knowledge of the word. Most of us have been praying without the knowledge of the word. We pray, we fast, but we don't have vast knowledge of the word. So when I came in here, has a woman that was scorned. You know, there's this saying that hell had no fury like a woman that scorned. I came in here like a scorned woman. I was, I was like a bee ready to sting anybody because I was going through a period in my life that it was a season that was so challenging and terrifying. And I, I felt the only way I could defend myself was to fight for myself because I didn't have the knowledge of the word of God. So I, to, an, to a reasonable extent, I can say that after that, when I started my journey here, as in when I started coming and I, you know, I opened myself up to the word of God to allow it to change me. Tas. One of my last meeting here on Wednesday, still on recovery for me. Sunday, Sunday does not solve Christianity pride. I sort of realized that I've been going to church all this while, but I didn't know God. I, I believe I knew Him, but I didn't. I know the God of the Bible, the one of the stories, 
But when I started coming to the fellowship, you know, there is a way you are taught that when I get to oh, really, this same passage of the Bible I've read before, did it, is this what is actually saying? So when now when I'm talking to people, I'm telling them I have a fellowship I go, and I have that covenant to God that, except I'm at work, if I'm not at work, I will be on ground, and even for Bible study, it doesn't matter what is all going on. So I always tell them the difference. You can go to church, but if you come to my fellowship, you will be fed with the word that you don't need to call your pastor at all times. After what I hear from my church on Sunday, I still feel that something missing. But once I come for the, uh, fellowship here, after hearing mommy nursing preach the word, I'm always filled up that yes, my inner mind is filled up with the word of God. And that word is what will transform me and that's how I practice whatever I hear from her because the most important thing is not hearing the word of God that she preached, it's by putting it into practice. During one of the service, God told our mommy in the house that he wants to hear my voice. Mommy never had, I'm, I'm not sure mommy knew, maybe I used to be in the choir, maybe I used to sing. And that was how I joined the Heaven's Day Choir. And gradually, God kept working on me to be a better person, to become who you have seen today, even though I am still a work in progress. The power of adoption and adopted. You now belong to Jesus. The devil doesn't have a right over the destiny. And let me say something why this assignment is so exceptional. You don't just pray. You are, we are taught to pray with the word in the will of God. It, it's rare. A lot of people just give you prayer point. No, here we are taught what is the scripture saying? What's God's intention about that situation you're going through? What is the word of God saying about it? And we are taught how to hold the word of God and wrestle over that challenge until it becomes a miracle. So when it comes to the word and to prayer, it's inevitable when it comes to real only ministry. Coming into Royal Olive Ministry, I opened my eyes that I have to stand. That devil does not listen to quiet prayer. He wants to see you go out. He wants to see you shout. He wants to see you show that you have the bigger power. You have that ability to face the devil. Yes, Royal Olive Ministry have really raised women, raised men. Mommy Nelson was like an anchor that kept me in this place. You understand? When I remember the word that if you don't come for fellowship, I'm bringing the fellowship to your house. That would ginger me to start running down here. And apart from that, when I get to this place, I have this, this peace within me. Then the word is another thing. The way the word is being taught in this place, I'm here to see somewhere else. I've tried several. It's not measuring up to the way it is here. This, anybody that comes here, you will experience the presence and the power of God in another dimension they've never seen. You cannot come to Royal Women, Royal Women and Men Ministry and your life will not be transformed. Things are different now. The Ade Damola before is not the Ade Damola now. Just like the scriptures is finding fulfillment in my life, that the part of the justice like a shining light that keeps shining brighter and brighter and brighter. I'm an expression of God's mercy. Shall I tell you the truth? I was deep down in the pit. But God of this assignment brought me out. He didn't only bring me out to leave me to stray. He stripped me out of the cloth of shame and clothed me with a garment of honor. He gave me a voice 
and he established my feet to stand on the mountain top. Generations to generations, I will keep telling them that the God of Royal Holy Ministry has done me well. There is no word that will be given that is a prophetic word that is not uh, uh, found from the scriptures. So they do everything from the scripture. They back whatever they're doing with the scriptures. I can see that uh, Momiduru is not alive, but the gift that the Lord has ordained that this assignment, this ministry will operate in, still in operation because he has decided to spread it as long as it's the gift of God. And that is what he has packaged his ministry to represent. That gift is still at work. The prophetic aspect of this ministry is still at work. One of the things I saw from the beginning was love. I saw another family where I can open up myself. Because the first thing before anything is love. So after Mommy Duvu died, when Mommy Nelson took over, when we started the ministry afresh again, I saw love. I saw unity in our midst because we were all standing as one and we all had one voice. This ministry is built on a solid foundation. Christ is the foundation. Even after the death of the visionary, the ministry is still waxing strong. What I will say when you talk about comparison, it's the fact that then, um, Momiduru, everybody look up to Momiduru, Momiduru, Momiduru. But now, what Momiduru was doing, what God was using Momiduru to do, was actually raising people. She didn't even know that she was not going to be alive to witness this day. But somehow, somehow, by divine arrangement, I don't know, it was people that were working with her, God was using her to train them. So it will look like um, some people are being batch, some people are being trash, while some people are being, you know, pamper. Those of us that were being bashed that time were the ones that are still outstanding. And now there is distribution of um, gifts. Same mommy do, same mommy nursing, mommy do operating all these gifts all these gifts and mommy nursing we know how to be mostly a teacher of it so it has been a source of concern and because of that in the place of prayers god will tell us that he has decided to share this gift that it was because the thing was just enclosed inside just one person that the best we didn't get the bed. And then mommy nursing happened to be somebody that is not moved because she, all she's after is to get the good thing out of you. If she see that gift, she's ready to help you. Not even looking at the fact that they will say, okay, maybe your voice is louder than her own or you are demonstrating God's power than her own. She, she's not moved and uh, it has been really helping us. Instead, she will use you in that area. And it has been helpful to the ministry because everybody now knows that, okay, in the area of prayers, this is the person that we do in areas of teaching. But that does not rule out the fact that we do know the head, the person that God has Lord has set as a set woman over it. After doing it, if you are used to following us, you see that after doing everything, everybody still come back to submit to her, to acknowledge the fact that she is the one that God has set as a set woman. And God told us one word that she is the mother of all the prophets. So for you to be more than perfect, so there is no prophetic gift inside of you. Searching the scriptures for at all levels is the uniqueness for us. We want to pray. I need to understand it through the scriptures. You are telling me about your marriage. I want to see it through the scriptures. And that, by the grace of God, is the selling point of this ministry. Oh, we are praying and things are happening. Is because we are praying his will. We are talking and it looks like there's demonstration of God's power because we are riding on his word. He cannot deny himself. So the foundation of this work is founded on the word. If it is in the word, then we are there. 
If it's not there, we are not there. Next 10 years, I'm seeing Oya Olive Ministry to be a household name not only in Nigeria but across the country. Because if you look at it now, our members are spreading and we are still in touch with them. And we believe because one of the primary assignments of this ministry is to raise family. To raise family. God is interested in bringing family back to the way it used to be. As a of old. I'm seeing the ministry spreading out. I see. People, because we are interdenominational, so wherever you find a royal man, royal woman, a royal child, I see an expression of the reality of the Bible. That we are not people that will come and talk about Bible stories. We will come with a life that is a reflection. I am seeing that 10 years from now, all around the world, when you think about royal women or men fellowship you are going to see disciples people who are standing in the order of scriptures to take over their territories happy 20th anniversary to royal olive ministry royal olive ministry happy 20th anniversary happy 20th anniversary to royal olive ministry happy 20th anniversary happy Anniversary to Royal Women and Men Fellowship. Happy 20th birthday. Happy anniversary to Royal Olive Ministries. Happy 20th anniversary. You know, as we are celebrating, the Lord celebrates you as well. Happy anniversary. And I pray that every good thing that is happening here is reflected in your life. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless you.